so hello and welcome to this webinar focusing on careers in port logistics and thank you all for joining me this is the second um webinar that we've done and it's a repeat of the one we did last thursday we just wanted to give um the option of two dates and times so for those of the, you that have not met me i'm rachel may i'm the director of employer involvement here at the career college trust and this afternoon, we've got three presenters, um, Lorna Wagner, who is Programme Manager for Careers and Outreach for Maritime UK. We've got Sarah Walsh, who is Head of Corporate Services at British Ports Association. And we've got Amanda Willis, who's the Group Human Resources Director for the Peel Ports Group. So if we just get everyone to introduce themselves, um, um, name and position and college would be great. Um, and then I will just give a little bit of a background around um, what Career Colleges Trust are doing um, and um, how, how the session is going to uh, play out this afternoon. So Lorna, would you like to go first? Sure. So my name's Lorna. Um, as Rachel said, I'm the programme manager for careers and outreach for the maritime sector. Uh, I've met some of you before, we've had conversations before, and we are working in partnership with the Careers Colleges Trust to support the development of the logistics pathway. So delighted to be with you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, would you like to go next? Hi yeah, everyone. So as Rachel said, I'm head of corporate services at the British Ports Association. So we're a trade body that represents all different ports and I'm in the UK and I'm here to kind of give a bit of an overview of the sector for you all. Brilliant, thanks. And um, it, its official name is Amanda Willis, but I believe she prefers Mandy. So, Mandy. You're on mute, Mandy. Sorry, my IT issue today, <laughs> as well as me being stupid, no help, thanks. Hopefully, you can all hear me. I'm having some IT issues. Um, my name is Willis Group HR Director. A bit of an overview of the ports industry and the types of roles that we have available in the ports industry. Um, just before I do that, I'm going to actually come out of this meeting and dial back in because I'm having some IT issues and I can't quite hear or see you yourselves. So just bear with me. Thanks, Mandy. So if we could go to Becky next. Yeah, I'm Becky Wilkins and I'm the Head of Marketing at City of Bristol College. Um, we're fairly new to the programme, so very much in the infancy stages. Lovely. Thanks, Becky. And the other Becky. Hello, I'm Becky, um, Head of Careers at Eastley College. Eastley College. Lovely. Great, great to have you on board, Becky. Thank, thank you. you. For, I know it was a little last minute sending the invite, but great to have no, you on thank board. You. Thank you. Uh, Leslie. Hi everyone, I'm Leslie Graham, I'm Principal at Stockton Riverside College. Great, the, the newest college to our, to our cluster, so welcome Leslie. Uh, Helen? Oh, here we go. Hi everyone. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not muted anymore, am I? No. Um, I'm Helen from uh, City of Bristol College. Um, I currently lecture in aviation, so aviation logistics is my kind, my thing. Uh, so this is all very new. So obviously very interested to learn all that we're going to um, hear about today. Great, thanks, Helen. Um, and then I've got Kay Judd. You can talk. Hello, sorry, just turning it off so you can all hear me. Um, my name's Kitty. Um, I'm from EC College as well. I'm the work experience coordinator. Um, it's always useful to speak to lovely people in um, lovely employment and we can maybe make some links, and maybe get some placements out of you guys, you never know. Um, but yeah, really interested to uh, listen to this. Great, lovely. Thanks, Kitty. Um, Paul? Yeah. Uh, Oh, which one? Sorry, my bad. Sorry, go on, Paul Austin. Yeah, I'm Paul Austin. I'm the curriculum manager for logistics, motor vehicle engineering and refrigeration at the college. Uh, and we're just uh, starting our journey with Careers Colleges Trust to uh, promote logistics within the Southampton Freeport area that uh, is being developed uh, and looking forward to it. And that, and that Paul's from Eastley College. And then the other Paul. 
Hi, I'm Paul Gibbon. I'm the current head of Career College Northeast. We currently specialise in advanced manufacturing IT. Um, we're starting to show a bit of an interest on the logistics avenue. Great. Welcome both, Pauls. And then the last lady is I've got Claire's iPhone. Hello, Claire. Claire's having a few technical issues. She's literally sitting in the same office as so us. So she's um, Claire's from Eastley as well. So yeah, she great. is. Good to so, have some, <laughs> Claire's so many. Our, Claire's uh, the work experience team leader. So, um, yeah, she's Brilliant. my boss. So, yeah. That's lovely. But she's listening. <laughs> yeah, no, no worries. Thanks ever so much, Kitty. Um, so just, um, I did mention earlier, we are recording the session so that we can um, send it out to uh, our um, cluster of career colleges to um, use internally with your staff that haven't been able to attend. Um, and um, I think Lorna's also hoping to use it amongst some of her marketing materials as well. So um, with no further ado, I'll make a start. Um, just to let you know, after um, each presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask uh, questions and, and, and have answers, um, but also we'll have make sure we've got a session at the end. So after I've just finished my introduction, we'll start with um, Lorna um, and who will give us a, a overview. And then we go into. Oh, sorry. No. Okay. No, that's fine. Um, and then and then we go into Sarah, then to Amanda from uh, Peel Ports, and then back to Lorna. But there's lots of times. This is a real, pod, you know, audience participation opportunity to ask lots of questions. So um, Charlie's okay. Great. Okay, Charlie. Hopefully you you're you're back in. So. Um, career colleges, the career colleges trust have been around since 2014. And we support further education colleges in developing curriculum in sector areas where there's a skills shortage. And you'll all be aware, highly aware that uh, logistics, um, there is a skills shortage. So our programme of support assists colleges with developing employer advisory boards for their curriculum areas, support with project based learning development and, deliver, and delivering uh, project based learning um, projects to their teachers and lecturers and making sure that's embedded in the curriculum, um, supporting with um, meaningful industry placements and ensuring that the young people that leave a career college have the professional skills to pursue a career in that sector. So about three years ago now, the Career College Trust were approached by a Dutch vocational training college, um, STC, which stands for C Training College. And um, we started working collaboratively with them around a port logistics sector um, college within the UK. We then started developing a new level three international supply chain logistics qualification with open awards, which is fully funded by, by the ESFA. But whilst we were doing that, we very quickly realized that we didn't just want to have it as port logistics, we wanted to incorporate road and air as well. So we've developed the qualification, which will incorporate the, the other pathways as well. We also wanted to develop the qualification to make sure that it had units around uh, project management, digital and marketing, and so that it was a much wider qualification to be delivered over two years through the study programme funding, um, so that it was more diverse and we had a broader spectrum of people that wanted to, to study and, and come onto the programmes. So we had hoped to have career colleges open this year, September 21, but with the pandemic, obviously, um, we've, we've popped that on hold to 2022, but we haven't stopped um, working on the project. So we are still working around engaging stakeholders and employers to support the project. We're also working on developing um, schemes of work and lesson plans, because one of the big things that um, all of our colleges that have come into the cl cluster have told us is that they've not got the expertise necessarily within their current staffing. Um, so we're, we're trying to make that more, more um, seamless and an easier um, opportunity for the colleges. 
And we're also looking at using much more immersive learning so that let's say for instance, if um, Helen in uh, City of Bristol is delivering something around, um, I don't know, importing and exporting a session on that, that it could be streamed to all of our other colleges across the country um, or um, videoed as well, so that if people can't attend, it's, it's there to be, um, to be shown at a later date. So your college has been approved to be a logistics career college with a port pathway um, and with a planned opening date of 2022. So in addition to the qualification support that we're doing, we're also very aware that staff need to understand what careers in port logistics looks like so that you can be ambassadors for the children, their parents and guardians, and to explore those career pathways and progress into a long, for those children to progress into a long established career in the sector. And I think when you hear Lorna's presentation, Sarah's and um, Mandy's, you will see that the careers and the um, longevity of a career in logistics is just phenomenal. And it's one of those sort of unforgotten careers that is so important to our everyday lives but we forget that actually it could be a ch career choice for our young people so with no further ado I will pass you over to Lorna. Thank you um, and if I can just say thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk to your FE partners. Sarah and um, Mandy have got real data and information for you about from the British Ports Association's point of view, the national kind of context of ports and logistics at the moment, and then what a port is like as an employer. And we felt if we did a, a bit about the maritime sector and shared that information with you, that if nothing else, you would go away today feeling more confident about your own knowledge of the port industry and its part in the maritime sector which we hope will help you to um, share that information and promote it to your feeder schools and to young people so they're interested in your, in your course. And as soon as they're able to start applying for it in October this year, obviously we hope that that's a really successful process for you. So I'm gonna share my screen. I hate doing this, I always say that, and it you know sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. But let's, let's go. Right, can I just, can someone confirm that you can see that, please? Oh, thank you, Rachel. <laughs> okay, so that's the Maritime Careers logo. So if I start off just by explaining who I am. So I'm the Programme Manager for Careers and Outreach for Maritime UK. Maritime UK is the umbrella um, organisation for the whole sector. Um, it sounds like a massive organisation. In reality, there are six of us but uh, we make a lot of noise. That's the logo for the careers programme. I've been doing this job for a little over a year and um, I have to declare that prior to that, I used to work for EC College. So those people that are on the call from EC College, they know me well, <laughs> but I've come from an FE background. I was managing all the support services at EC College until I started in this job last May. Started this job because it was gonna give me the opportunity to travel, how wrong I was. Anyway, we'll move on from that. So as I said, I'm here today to talk about the whole sector and I've brought with me two um, very helpful ladies, one from the British Ports Association and one from Field Ports. So hopefully by the end of the day, you will feel so much more confident about ports as a business, about the logistics and about how it's gonna be easy for you to sell this, this qualification to your young people. So where are we coming from on this? Well, the, the maritime sector employs 1.1 million people in the UK. That is approximately one in every 66 human beings in our nation, which is massive. And, you know, comes as a bit of a shock. And then you step back and you think, well, we are an island nation. How many miles of coastline have we got? How many ports, harbours, marinas, etc.? And then it, it makes more sense. What is true though, I'm echoing what Rachel um, said earlier, is that the careers within the maritime sector are like Britain's best kept secret. For some reason, the maritime sector isn't recognized in the same way as others are. It's not known as well. So the Department for Transport wrote the Maritime 
2050 strategy about five years ago. And the work that went into that identified that the sector was about to double in size. And in fact, they were talking about the sector doubling in size by 2030. So by 2030, 2.2 million jobs. But it's not all the same jobs again. The sector is growing up and it's modernising in terms of computerisation, in terms of digitalising. And then there's all the work that's going around the headline target of that strategy, which is for the whole sector to be carbon net zero by 2050. So huge numbers of opportunities in research and development, huge opportunities in the industries that support wind and wave power generation, for example, and so on. But other developments along robotics, autonomous uh, work within a port or any of the other industries, huge advancements in, um, in engineering. We've got the new shipbuilding strategy, which is, is currently um, under review, it was it was launched a few months ago and it's very much concentrated on the Royal Navy, but the government have taken it back in and said, actually, we need to make this broader than that. And it's about all shipping, all boats. So they're working on that at the moment. Um, we were also named as one of the, the sectors in the government's 10 point um, plan for the green industrial revolution. And that's to do with the decarbonisation. And we were named as one of the recovery sectors post COVID. So maritime's coming up all over the place. Um, careers at sea and onshore, you know, 75% of the jobs in the sector are onshore. A young person at a school in Southampton that I was doing a careers event with asked me a question and they said, do you have to get your feet wet to work in the maritime sector? And it's like my favorite question that I've been asked since I started this job 14 months ago. The answer is of course not. And obviously, when you're on a boat, you would hope not to be getting your feet wet, otherwise potentially you've got a problem. So 75% of the jobs are onshore and are supporting the other 25% to go to sea. So ports, harbours and marinas, we're going we're to talk about ports and harbours today, not so much marinas, but ports, harbours and marinas are one of the industries within the sector. Boat building, ship building, naval architecture. I'd never really heard about naval architecture before I started doing the research to apply for this job. Um, I'm sure you can work out what it is, but it's people that are involved in the design, the building, the refurbishment, the repair, that, that whole lifespan of a, of a boat or a ship. Sea fishing, aquaculture, and marine science are all part of the maritime sector. Marine biologists work within the maritime sector. And I've been doing a piece of work recently with the National Oceography Centre to sort of explore jobs there. Who knew that they employ 600 scientists across their two sites in Southampton and, and Liverpool? And if you want something fun to look up, look up yellow submarines in Loch Ness with the National Oceography Centre. They've been developing autonomous and emission-free subs they're bright yellow. I don't know why they're yellow, except that the National Oceanography Centre is in Southampton and Liverpool. There's got to be there's got to be a link. But these are autonomous and and emission free. And what they're saying is that if the research using these particular vessels works, then the way that the whole world collects data um, in marine science will change because these submarines can go deeper and they can stay out for longer than if you've got human beings on board. So really exciting stuff there. Um, super yachts and leisure boating. Super yachts is a whole industry in itself. And I was told recently that you define a super yacht by being a yacht that is crewed by a professional crew rather than the size of it, or heaven forbid, how many zeros are on the sale price sticker. Um, leisure boating is enormous and actually has got busier and busier to do with the pandemic. You know, last summer we met with some leisure boat, um, uh, oh, there was a manufacturer and another organisation that sold them and rented them for holidays and whatever. They were both saying they hadn't had as busy a year in over five years. There was something about the way that British people were thinking about their time off and getting out in the fresh air and spending time with their families and so on that was encouraging them to buy boats. Um, but crewing of super yachts is something that, that uh, young people like to go and do, and they maybe think they're going to do it for a year and then turn it into a career. But who wouldn't want to be sailing around the most beautiful parts of the world? The Royal Navy and the Merchant Navy, it, it surprises me, not so much now as it did when I first started, but how many careers advisors aren't able to um, 
describe the difference between the two, let alone young people. But Royal Navy, excuse my cat, she likes to join in. Royal Navy being um, obviously defence as well as maritime and the Merchant Navy being all working ships around that. Um, engineering, we've recently struck up a partnership with Engineering UK because we've got aligned um, objectives and we'll be doing some work together over the next few months. Um, but the, the someone said to me recently, let's stop calling it engineering because that puts people off. Let's call it creative problem solving, which I quite liked. Oh, I can see a little dog in the background. That makes me feel better. Lovely little dog. Oh, this is Pixie. Um, inland waterways also form part of the sector. And I am talking about canal boats. I'm talking about city cruises. I'm talking about water taxis, etc. Work boats and tugs and then business services. So every one of those maritime businesses in each of those industries obviously has business services. It has an accounts department. It has someone that's answering the phones. It has someone that's dealing with the, the customers and so on and so forth. But there are specific maritime business services as well, such as being a maritime lawyer, such as being a ship broker, such as being um, a surveyor with Lloyd's Register or whatever. So, as I said before, we hope by the end of the session, you will understand better the national ports context and what's going on there. We're also going to share a little short video, which is the best thing that I've seen so far, explaining what a free port is and what the benefits are and what it's going to bring to um, a part of the, the country. The one that I work most closely with, because I, I also work for Solent, that is in the Solent. But it's a geographical area that is um, has a 42 mile kind of radius. Um, understand better a port as a business. A Portsmouth International Port that I've done a lot of work with employ three and a half thousand people. And we know that young people stand on, on the shore, if you like, or, or stand where they live and they look out to sea and see straight past the port. They don't look at it and think. That's a massive employer that's been there for a long time. That's a really robust business. I want to go and work for them. So we're trying to help you understand the port as a business. We've got a super video um, in the careers pages on our, on our website, which is um, understanding Portsmouth International Port, which you're all welcome to use any of the resources on the Maritime UK website. Um, but it breaks down the port into business functions and then from the business functions goes down into the different job roles. So it really helps with that um, level of understanding. So what are we telling people about the sector? Well, we're telling people that it's a well-paid career. Um, when these when this data was compiled um the national average wage was 29,000 pounds and in the maritime sector it was 38. lots of different ways to come in the kind of ship um to shore transition is as big as it as it ever was uh people that start out with perhaps a cadet ship and go off to sea and then their things change in their life and they want to be on shore as well that's that's a big a big shift but I've been hearing only today about a brand new apprenticeship that's coming online, which is in port operations. Um, so apprenticeships is, is really high on our agenda and, and there's no one way to come in. It, we're also, as a sector, particularly good at sponsoring lifelong learning for, for adults. The green revolution I've talked to you about. So, you know, as a child, we all drew cargo ships, cruise ships, whatever, and there would be a big puff of black smoke coming out of the, of the funnel. That has to change, and that's no small thing. I'm glad they're not asking me to come up with a solution for that, because I'd have no chance. But, you know, if you're a young person that's interested in science and technology and engineering, and also interested in climate change, they couldn't, they, it's unlikely they could find somewhere where there's fewer kind of opportunities to, um, more opportunities, I should say, to get involved in that research development in the pushing the boundaries with engineering. And I've said about the sector doubling in size by 2030. Talked about funded careers, and then we've talked about um, careers at sea and at shore, chance to travel the world, unless you're into a pandemic and then you never leave your home, but we'll, we'll hope that's all changing now. Um, so I hope that that helps you just get a little overview I think that's my last one for now it is. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand over to Sarah, 
who is who's going to talk about the, the national port context. Yep, thanks, Lord. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, should see that. Okay, so yes, um, as I said before, um, my name is Sarah Walsh. I'm Head of Corporate Services at the British Ports Association. Um, I'm here today to kind of give you a quick overview of the port sector in the UK. Um, I'm going to explain the role and role of ferries and containers in the context of port logistics, and then touch on a few kind of key topics and issues for the sector. Um, so it's COVID-19, Brexit and the global container congestion, marine environment, free course, and a bit about careers at the end as well. So firstly, just a little bit about the BPA. Um, so we're a trade body. We represent about 350 ports, harbours, terminals, marinas, all throughout the UK. Um, as you see on the right hand side there, there are 452 harbour authorities in the UK. 130 of those are cargo handling ports, and there's around 65 major ports. So you can imagine as an island nation, a um, lot of coastliners, Lorna explained, um, lots of different types of ports, sizes of ports, every kind of corner of the country. Um, all ports in the UK are all independent of government, so they receive no systematic funding from the middle, and they're all very diverse, and they compete against each other, and there's also a wide range of cargoes and activity that goes on at each of these ports. So a few examples I've listed there are offshore energy, renewables, decommissioning, leisure marine, tourism, fishing, a uh, roll and roll of ferries, uh, cruise ships, energy, ship repair and shipbuilding. So really it is kind of every corner of the country there is a port of some sh uh, shape or size and um, it could be say a small little fishing or marina in say southwest of England and Cornwall or maybe up to the larger ports like Southampton, Dover, Aberdeen, Belfast. Um, just thinking about ports, um, they are hubs, they're, they're gateways, they're there to facilitate trade, and they're also part of the wider logistics system. Um, every port would have a schedule of charges, so that explains how much each of their customers would pay. That might be a small yacht coming into more for a couple of days in a marina. That's also up to the big, say, container container port, uh, container port, ships, um, oil tankers that come into ports, obviously pay a lot more money for them to berth in the port. It might be a pilot who comes on board to bring the ship in. Um, probably some cranes offload the containers, say. Um, but yeah, every port would have, have that to cover their, their costs for running the port. Um, port traffic and, and throughput has been increasing um, over sort of recent years. And um, we think between now and 2050, it's gonna increase by 40%. So you think that is, is more trade coming in out of the country, um, more jobs would come, would come with that as well. And hopefully the sector is gonna be stronger than ever. 95% um, of all trade comes through ports. So that's anything that kind of arrives into the country is through a port on a ship. And the other 5% is aviation. Um, in terms of ownership, there's three types there. So the first one is private. So that's like any other private sector company. And there's a group of shareholders that own the business and like the port management would report into their shareholders. And I imagine they'd also pay out a dividend now and then as well. A um, couple of examples for, for the port sector is, say, Associated British Ports. So they own 21 ports throughout the country, and the biggest one is Southampton. There's also Fourth Ports, so that's a couple of ports in Scotland and also London Gateway. Um, another one might be Peel Ports, so lots of ports in the country, the biggest one, Liverpool, and also there's one, the Bristol Port, that's a private port as well. Uh, next up, we have municipal ports. So they are owned and operated by local authorities. Uh, they tend to be sort of small to medium sized ports, but the biggest one for a local authority owned port is Portsmouth International Port, which you probably have heard of. Um, so the ones are Sunderland, and there's also up in Scotland, there's the Orkney Islands and Shetland Islands. Um, so each of their councils own and operate the ports up there. Um, and thirdly, we have trust ports. So they are quite a unique model. I mean, there are kind of other trust bodies in other parts of the economy and sectors. Um, but for ports, it's kind of, it means that the ports don't really have a shareholder. There's no kind of parent company. There's no kind of owner as such. They just are there independently on their own. Um, any surplus or profits are reinvested into the port. And they're very good for kind of thinking about their stakeholders and their, their local communities. And also they're thinking about the future. So they want to see 50, 100, 200 years. What does the port need to kind of be sustainable and successful and profitable? Um, they're thinking about kind of maybe doing some expansion plans or um, 
investing in infrastructure. Um, so they're always investing in the port and their people and also their stakeholders. Just thought I'd touch on devolution because I know if there's a couple of colleagues that were invited from other parts of the UK, not just England. Um, so just want to explain that ports policy is devolved. So that means Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, they each have government departments that oversee ports policy, uh, ports regulation, um, uh, new legislation coming in relevant for ports. They each have their own um, responsibilities and they, they tend to be quite similar, but different paces. Normally England leads, um, maybe slightly different versions in devolved nations. Um, but yeah, they're all independent. They work closely with a lot of things, I think, and try to be aligned as much as possible. Um, and but for shipping policy, it's reserved. So that means it's the UK policy. It's the Department for Transport that oversees this. Um, so yeah, no matter where you are in the UK in terms of shipping, it's all kind of the one set of legislation, one of the regulation, and one sort of policy responsibility there for the Department for Transport. Okay, now thinking about trade that comes in and out of ports, um, all up, there's about 470 million tonnes of port traffic that goes through ports each year. I'm breaking this down a bit more. Um, firstly, we have liquid bulk. So that is kind of anything that's liquid form and loose. So not in a, in a container or anything like that. It could be things like fuels and oils, um, but also maybe wine or orange juice as well. Um, next, we have dry bulk. So that's anything loose, but in a dry form. So you think about all the construction materials, so sand and aggregates and different sized rocks, but also things like grains and wheat as well. Uh, next up we have row row so that stands for roll on roll off and that's um the ferries you may have seen um so that's when say lorries or, or cars drive onto the ferries and then they they have a couple of hours to maybe say france or spain it's always within europe they, they don't go further than that um and i'll touch on a bit more about the ferries shortly and lastly we have the low low so that's load on load off and that's all the container ports and, and ships um, so yeah, the same thing, it's in a, in a container, um, it's those big container ships I'm sure you've probably seen photos of um, coming into the ports and um, yeah, I'll go into a bit more detail shortly as well. Thinking about traffic, where did it come from and where does it go to? Um, you see that big donut on the left hand side and just over half of traffic is EU traffic. So Brexit was very big for our sector. Um, we kind of, yeah, like maybe the, the average general member of the public wouldn't have appreciated um, how much come goes through Europe. Um, but yeah, it's been quite a challenge. Um, you see roughly around say 15% or so comes from other parts of Europe and the Americas and Asia. And on the right hand side, um, this is our inbound and outbound traffic. So I guess roughly around say 70% or so is imports into the UK. So as an island nation, we always rely on a lot of imports and then 30% is um, exports. So I guess you think about all the, the containers and, and the lorries that come to the country, 30% of them have goods to kind of go back to, say, the EU or, EU or other countries. Okay, I just thought I'd kind of touch on a few key topics, key, key issues that are affecting the sector, um, just to give a bit of context of what's going on at the moment. Um, in terms of COVID-19, um, since the start of the pandemic, I think every port has been affected in one way or another, um, some more than others, depending on what kind of traffic they have, what kind of activities they are, they handle. Um, I think all ports experience a decline in throughput and activity, um, kind of regardless of where they were, what, what they handled. Um, at the start of the pandemic, um, manufacturing and construction was definitely hard, badly hit, um, kind of a big slowdown there or, or stopping completely. Um, but both have picked up a lot since then. Um, I think particularly construction, um, you think about home renovations and extensions and new sheds and new pools going into backyards. Um, where does all that material come from? It's all being mostly imported, I think. Um, and ports are very busy at the moment handling construction materials. Um, I guess new buildings being built and roads upgraded, things like that. It's all kind of coming through a port. Uh, fishing and the seafood sector in general um, badly hit, particularly at the start. I'm um, thinking of the lockdowns, um, restaurants and hospitality completely closed. So there was just no market at all for, for any kind of seafood. Um, and it's not just UK, it was Europe, it's maybe they're exporting to Asia. They are all kind of had lockdowns um, so a lot last year. Um, slowly picking up, I think Brexit also had a big impact because that was first of January this year. Um, sorry, last year. Um, those new changes came in that affected um, fishermen and the fishing sector. 
slowly picking up, but I think prices are still quite low when you compare it to 2019. But I think now as lockdown has eased in the last few months, um, hospital is open, there's a bit more demand for um, for fishing. We'll slowly kind of get back to normal rates, hopefully. Um, on ferries and, and cruise, um, this with international coming to sorry, international travel coming to a halt, those two sectors were hugely affected. Um, ferries, I'll go into a bit more detail, but like they have passengers and lorries. Um, so with no passenger travel um, allowed for, for abroad, and that was kind of a big hit to the ferry companies and, and they kind of had some cash flow problems I mentioned as well. And cruise, um, so cruise was completely um, brought to a halt for around 12 months or so. And the first kind of cruise has started back in England about a month or so ago now, I think. Um, just domestic cruises and it's smaller capacities on allowed on the ships. So just going out like a couple of days at a time around England. Um, Wales and Northern Ireland have started up cruising as well in the last so two weeks ago or so. And we're still waiting on Scottish government to announce when they might allow cruise to restart. But we're thinking um, probably in a couple of weeks time um, with sort of stage four of the, the lockdown easing, hopefully mid July. We think that will mean larger cruise ships can start cruising around. I'm still waiting on government to confirm that, but it's slowly kind of getting back to normal. And then we'll start to think about international travel as well after that for cruise. It's got a, okay. <laughs> and for all ports, I think health and safety of their employees was, was number one throughout the pandemic. Um, I, I guess the case for all other sectors and industries as well. It was really important that all of their key workers were able to come into work and, and work safely. They would have introduced different policies and procedures of social distancing where possible, um, hygiene measures, wearing masks, um, working in shift patterns, keeping bubbles. Um, and for so large ports, there's really quite a number of key roles that if those personnel aren't there, it really the port would struggle to kind of get the ships in. Um, things like pilots who, who climb board the ships to, to bring the ship into the port. Um, the kind of the boat crews who help with that. And there's also the BTS, so that's the vehicle traffic management people who are there to kind of communicate with the ships and get them in. So the ports paid really special attention to those roles to make sure they were kept in bubbles and kept kind of as away from everyone else as much as possible. Um, really happy to report that all the ports were able to stay open throughout the pandemic and they always had enough staff there. I'm sure there were kind of maybe day-to-day -day logistical operational challenges they faced, I'm sure. But um, yeah, really happy to say that all the ports were all key workers and they've all kind of done a fantastic job to kind of keep the country moving, keep the food and medicines and fuel coming into the country. So yeah, it's been a quite a great achievement. Um, as I mentioned before, travel restrictions, that's had a big impact just in terms of passenger travel um, on cruises and, and ferries um, towards the start of the pandemic. And the government was really kind of a bit concerned about having enough ferries that would bring in um, the goods and the medicines and the food. Um, so they just wanted to ensure that there was enough kind of ferries coming between the EU and, and the UK to ensure that food was coming in. So they bought some capacity on ferries just to make sure that everything continued, regardless of the no passengers on the ferries, which may have possibly, I guess, made a couple of issues there. And for those who have lifeline ferries, something like Isle of Wight and Isle of Sissy, um, up in Scotland for the islands, um, the government kind of stepped in to say, we really need to ensure that those ferries are there, continuing even though there's no passengers, there's no tourism. But um, <coughs> um, they stepped in just to kind of ensure a couple of regular services are still going, people can still kind of go to work and go to doctor's appointments and things like that. So that was a, a good help as well. And we're continuing to work with government on recovery, as a lot of touched on before. Um, Maritime has got a big role to play, I think, in building back better, but also in a, in a greener and sustainable way and contributing to the government's decarbonisation plan. So we're all kind of working together on that at the moment and thinking about how we can yeah, contribute to the country going forward and so forth. So just want to explain a bit about roll and roll off ferries. So we call that row row. Um, the port of Dover, um, it's Europe's busiest port of ferry port, um, handles around 10,000 lorries every day. Which to me, it's just mind boggling. I can't imagine that many lorries coming and going. Um, but yeah, there's got a I guess, great lot of operational team there, great system of how they just kind of flow in and out of the port. And we think there's around 35 terminals in the UK that have row row ferries coming along. Um, there's a few in the Humber, a little the south coast. Um, in addition to Dover, there's Portsmouth, there's Poole, there's New Haven. And in Wales, there's the port of Milford Haven. 
and the Stenline port there, um, and a couple of rowers in Ireland, Republic of Ireland, and on the west coast of Scotland as well. Um, when we think about row road, there's always going to be two options. There's the accompanied and unaccompanied traffic. So that this means is the driver with their trailer. So sometimes the driver may just drive their trailer up to the port in, say, the UK, drop it off, the port will then unload it onto the ferry, and then on the other side, say, France or Spain, um, there's someone, another driver there to, to take, their, take the lorry and drive to the destination. In most cases, it is accompanied. So all those 10,000 lorries through Dover, they're all accompanied. So that means the driver is with the trailer and drives from their destination in the UK over to the EU and does that journey. And I think particular challenge for this sector is driver shortages. It's always been there. It's kind of been increasing over the last have like five, 10, 20 years, whatever it might be. Um, but I think Brexit and COVID has really um, made that even even more of a challenge um, of having enough drivers to transport goods. I know you, there's a lot of kind of press around of say, the Sainsbury's of the world and other big companies like that who are really struggling to recruit drivers and get their goods transported from different parts of the UK. It's also Europe. It's 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 everywhere. Um, but yeah, it's it's something that we kind of have to factor in, and it can cause some problems at ports if like there's not enough drivers to pick up the trailers sometimes, and we have to think about where do we store these trailers and how we kind of keep traffic flowing smoothly. And lastly, Brexit of course has had a big impact on the sector. Um, export controls came into force at first of January this year, so that means anything that's being exported from the UK into the EU, and um, extra paperwork and certification has to be done. Um, there may be some checks at the port when they get to the EU destination, um, but for anything coming into the country, so imports, and um, the checks and things will come in place from 1st of January 2022. So it's not every lorry that needs to be checked. It's got to be risk-based. <coughs> yeah, you'll see what they've, they've got in the trailer and maybe um, certain forms kind of advise what they're de declaring, but still oh, there's got to be a lot of changes going on from the 1st of January. Um, we think railroad ports will definitely feel the kind of branch of these um, these new controls coming into place. Um, they've been doing a lot of work in the last few years with the government and their kind of local contacts and different agencies there. As we say, we think there's about 36 agencies at the port. That could be things like Border Force, who there for immigration checks, um, Plant and Animal Health, and the Forestry Commission. Um, there's, yeah, there's lots of different bodies who all need to work together. And I think the port is there to kind of coordinate them all and, and bring them all together and, and try and make it quite a smooth process for the customers. And um, to, sort of, to kind of be ready in time for these import controls, um, ports have had to build some infrastructure at their, their site if they have space. If they don't have space, there's going to be inland facilities being built to say for Dover when we say those 10,000 lorries coming through. They obviously don't have enough space to build a lot of warehouses or have some car parking for the lorries. So inland facilities being built but for those ports that do have space they are building some infrastructure where all these different agencies there um, have, a, have a space, have an office, can, can do checks when needed. <coughs> okay, think about containers now. So that's the load on, load off. Um, ultimately, it's always the importer and exporter who's responsible. Um, ports are there just to facilitate any goods coming and going through the port. Uh, the biggest container ports in the UK are Felix Stowe, Southampton, London Gateway and Liverpool. And how we think of how what happens after the container gets into the port. Um, it's sent to distribution centres around 70% by road. So that's lorry drivers again with, with their trailers and around 30% by rail. So that would mean there's a rail link at the port who then distributes the or moves the containers inland and um, some, I guess, distribution centre or other facility. Um, container sector in general has definitely grown a lot in, in recent years. Um, it's, it's, it's booming. You think of just general changes to more things coming from China and a bit more um, manufactured goods coming into the UK, a lot more demand from, from the population. Um, and that means bigger container ships. And for ports, that means they need to be ready of what changes coming up. So if there's a bigger ship, do they have enough space? Is, is the berth big enough? Are the cranes big enough? Um, do they need to do any dredging? So is there enough space between the seabed and the ship? Do they need to maybe dig out a bit more of the seabed to make space? So yeah, always bigger ships and kind of bigger ports need to be there to, to accommodate them. 
Um, all part of the process of getting a container from A to B, wherever that might be, there's always going to be ship brokers, ship agents, and port agents. So they all kind of have their own role to play of communicating between different parties. So you say getting your TV from a factory in China into your shop in the UK, there's all these kind of intermediaries in between there. You communicate with each other and make sure it gets on the ship and then make sure the ship gets into, into the UK and, and so forth after that. Um, just that I touched on Ever Given, I'm sure you've all heard it in the news from the Suez Canal and it blocked the canal, uh, I think it was last year, maybe this year, lose a chunk of time. Anyway, just kind of, I guess, shipping has been in the spotlight a bit recently. Um, is I think quite incredible how this one ship blocking a canal can kind of have such an effect on global trade. Um, yeah, I think everyone's kind of can relate to that and just, yeah, I think it's huge kind of logistical challenge there, but um, yeah, it's interesting to, to hear how it affected everyone. And also congestion. Um, so around Christmas time last year, I think it was really felt of um, things being caught up in, in ports and not being able to get to the shops in time. Um, there was a bit of media coverage on that, um, but it wasn't just the UK problem. It was all throughout the world, um, Europe and US included. Um, and, and why why is this kind of congestion going on? Um, a lot of kind of up and down from COVID-19, a lot of disruption, thinking about different lockdowns. So say China and Asia went to lockdown first. Um, so that really kind of halted their manufacturing. A um, lot of shipping kind of decreased coming out of China. And then there's parts of Europe and America went into lockdown. Um, things really dropped off here as well. Um, all, all those goods that were kind of in transit, what do we do with them? If we're in lockdown, we're planning to to sell these things or, or cars or TVs, whatever it might be, um, demand as well. I guess people were quite cautious to begin with. They didn't want to spend too much money on things they don't need, but maybe now opening up a bit more, people feel a bit more secure. They're buying new TVs instead of going on holidays, they're doing renovations or treating themselves to a new iPad, say. So I think consumer demand has gone up and down a lot. Um, retail has been open and shut. You know, the shops have been open and shut. Um, it's all kind of contributed to a lot of yeah, a lot of challenges there. And also there's been a shortage of containers, which is interestingly. Um, so things have just kind of been sitting in warehouses a bit longer than they normally would as lockdowns and demand have gone up and down. Yeah, so it just means there's empty containers in say the rest of the world, but not in Asia. And how do they get these containers back to Asia? So there's more goods to come out. So that's all being felt across the world. And what has this meant? Um, it's been increased costs for importers and ultimately the end consumer. Um, someone told me once, I think uh, it was around 800 US dollars to transport a container from China to the UK. It's now up to around, say, like 5,000 US dollars per container. So it's been a big jump, I guess, about six, sometimes increase um, as, as what prices normally would. So I don't know if we're feeling it yet as a consumer, but I think if it keeps going like this, we definitely will have some increased prices. Um, increased dwell times at ports. That just means how long is the container sitting in the port before it's collected by the lorry driver? I guess with the shortages I mentioned, that is a kind of a factor as well, but just if there's no space, if there's no warehouse facilities there to take it in, if we're in a lockdown, what happens then? Um, you may have read about all the PP that was being ordered by government and blocking up some ports. Um, so yeah, it's been quite a challenge. And um, they've all kind of come through it, I think quite well, have all worked with their different partners and stakeholders to kind of clear any, any blockages or any congestion. But yeah, it is just kind of a, a factor that ports can think about of, when are these trailers being, when are the sorry containers being picked up, and um, if they need any extra storage. Just that I briefly mention um, sustainability here. It's definitely been a huge kind of um, increased amount of focus for the port sector in the last couple of years. And um, I've got two colleagues at the BPA who mostly focus on sustainability um, issues and working with the port sector on this. Um, I guess all of government is considering how they can achieve their climate change kind of ambitions and decarbonisation and, and climate change. And um, for ports, the kind of things that we're, we're focusing at the moment is open loop scrubbers, water quality, uh, ship to ship oil transfers, ballast water, a dredging, noise and shore power. So as Lorna said, yeah, lots going on in the environmental um, part, of the, part of the sector. So plenty of jobs there that make for the future. Just that I touch on free ports as well. I know some of your colleges are based in free port areas. Um, there were eight free ports announced in England as part of the budget in uh, March this year. Um, other parts of the UK are still kind of yet to announce any kind of bidding process or what exactly a free port might look like there. As we said, it's all devolved um, this 
for Freeports. Um, so it's really up to them to make their own decisions and maybe do a slightly different version of the English Freeport. Um, we know Scotland are doing a green port, so it's going to be very similar, but also a stronger environmental and sustainability angle for them. Uh, but they are kind of lagging behind um, the English Freeport, so there's going to be some delay there. And um, you see in the map there, there's the, the eight Freeports um, throughout the UK. And on my next slide, I've just got a video that explains Freeports. So I'm just going to play that in about a minute or so. on um, careers, skills and diversity. Um, as, as Lorna has explained already, I'm sure um, Mandy's going to go into a bit more detail, but there's so many different opportunities at ports for careers. Um, it's so much more than kind of what we may have thought of a, a dock, dock word or doing night shifts, staying in the rain, and there's endless, endless opportunities. Um, and through the BPA, we've done kind of a lot of work with Lorna and her colleagues um, supporting their careers and diversity work and um, really trying to improve that for the sector. Um, we're also launching our own People in Ports um, initiative later this year. So we've been working with Lorna on that, just fitting, um, explaining the role of ports and the, the amazing amount of jobs that are available in the sector. Um, just kind of supporting Maritime UK's wider maritime careers promotional work with a bit on the ports as well. Just going to get the word out there a bit more. And here I've just included a bit of a list of the different um, job opportunities there are within the ports sector. Um, we think about 101,000 people are employed directly by ports and of course there's much, much more um, with different say contractors and other kind of nearby businesses who are all part of ports um, ecosystems. Um, yeah, as we see there, like modes of onshore and offshore roles. Um, yeah, I won't go through them all, but yeah, lots and lots of opportunities out there and we're really happy to have you all on board to try and um, promote the career sector. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to Mandy now, if you're ready for your slides. Yes, please. Is that working okay? You can see? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Hi, everyone. So my name is Mandy Willis and I'm the HR Director at Peel Ports Group. Uh, so I'm just going to go through a little bit about what Peel Ports Group is, um, who they are, what they do, and a bit about their roles and opportunities within Peel Ports, but also within the ports industry as a whole. Um, give you a bit of background to myself. Um, I'm actually, my background's in the financial services industry. I was a pensions professional advising companies on their pension schemes. Um, Peel Ports approached me about nine years ago to come and be their in-house pensions manager. Um, to be honest, I didn't really know much about what Ports Group did, which is quite embarrassing considering I'm from Liverpool and I drive past the port nearly every day and I saw the cranes every day. I didn't really understand what went on behind those gates. Uh, I kind of assumed it was a load of big hairy dockers which is obviously not a brilliant thing to say but that's what I assumed uh, came on board and the range and diversity of roles and opportunities is mind-boggling if I'm going to be honest and I'll go through some of the roles as, as we go through this uh, we have got some challenges in the ports industry um, so I'll be aware of some of them we talk about diversity I think because people see the ports industry as very male orientated uh, we sometimes struggle to recruit females and, and that's our challenge as an industry as a whole at the moment and that's what we're trying to do and um, promoting the industry to everyone but obviously focusing on the roles that are available um 
and the opportunities and flexibility that we do give. And there's various programmes going on in relation to that. We're linking in with the likes of um, UK Major Ports Group to work on a future skills project, which also includes diversity. We're linking in with lo local colleges, schools and universities to promote um, diversity and try to help us uh, face the challenges that we're fa facing. Um, we have done a lot of things. So we take Peel Ports Group as a whole. We've amended our uh, maternity policy. So we have a return to work maternity bonus of 20% of salary. Uh, we've re introduced flexible working, you know, you name it, we've done it, but we've still got that challenge. And it's not just us as a, an organisation, it's across the whole of the, the ports industry. Uh, but we are all determined to, to make change. So I guess that's our biggest challenge um, at the moment from a, a people's perspective. Uh, so sorry, if you wouldn't mind turning the slide, that'd be great. So a lot of people may not have heard of Peel Ports Group. Uh, more people seem to have heard of Peel Group. So Peel, um, if you've heard of Media City, obviously watch BBC News in the morning, Peel own Media City. So a lot of people have heard of that. John Lennon Airport, a number of wind farms, um, and many, many other businesses across the whole of the UK. Uh, it, it is a large company and we're a third of, of their overall business. So you can turn the page again, Sarah. In terms of Peel Ports Group as a whole, we've got a number of ports across the UK and one over in Ireland. So if we, if we go north to south, uh, we've got a number of ports up in on the Clyde uh, with a, a diverse portfolio of commodities that Sarah referred to earlier, uh, whether it's bulk, whether it's containers, um, we've got a number up there. We did have, a, well, we still got a port in Hunston. Now, Hunston was a coal port, and as many of you will know, coal fell off the face of the earth a couple of years ago, or the face of the country in the, a couple of years ago. So we're currently looking at opportunities in relation to our Hunston terminal, and um, the plans that we've got are amazing. Um, and it's really going to turn it around. So, you know, one of the things that I find about working for a ports industry, it's a very diverse industry, particularly in a ports group like, like we have here. So when you do have issues like coal or when you've got issues like COVID, you tend to be able to um, ride the wave and come out the other side still positive. Uh, Sarah's obviously touched on COVID. Uh, I'll carry on talking about the, this chart in a minute, but Sarah's touched on COVID. But as a ports industry, we were all classed as key workers. So everyone remained on site, kept the country importing and exporting all the goods that we use uh, every day. We were key to the NHS, um, bringing in blood plasma, et cetera. Uh, so we did make a difference. And I think working in the ports industry, we've been very proud of being key workers um, over, over the last probably nearly 18 months now, isn't it? So I'm going to carry on going down that slide. Uh, down Our next port is Hesham, which is a roll on, roll off ferry terminal, which um, Sarah mentioned earlier on. Then um, our biggest port is Port of Liverpool. Uh, you may have seen, if you, if you know Liverpool, we've got some new red ship to shore cranes. So if you're on the Wirral or across Liverpool, you can see the big red ship to shore cranes. Um, if anyone, we tend to use acronyms and terminology in the ports industry, but the ship to shore cranes are the ones that basically go over the river or the sea or the dock and take the containers off the vessel and put it onto a tug or a, you know, a straddle carry or whatever it is. So yes, that's our biggest term. And we have a number of different operations here at Liverpool, whether it's bulks, grain, biomass, um, containers, rail. We've got our own rail set, rail um, operation here, uh, which is quite significant. We've then got Manchester Ship Canal. Uh, with a, a bulk terminal there and we also use the Manchester Ship Canal to transport containers or goods um, from Liverpool into uh, the warehouses along the Manchester Ship Canal heading into Manchester so it's a great way to keep um, vessels sorry containers off the uh, off the road which is obviously great from a CO2 perspective. Then we're carrying going down down in the southeast we've got Medway and Great Yarmouth uh, who are a mixture of um, bulk products and um, and oil and gas. And then over in Dublin, we've got a, a terminal over there which focuses on containers. So a number of terminals across the whole UK, and our, our mixed portfolio is probably very similar to other ports industry ports groups across the UK. So if you've got a port company near you, they they'll no doubt have some of the some of the products and commodities that we have here at Peel Ports. Uh, have you turn the slide, Sarah. So in terms of roles within Peel Ports, I mentioned before. Um, we, it is a very diverse type of organisation to work in. Uh, I didn't appreciate it before I joined Peel Ports. 
So at the moment, we've got over 300 different roles within the organization. We've got 1,700 employees, so 300 different roles, which is quite phenomenal. Uh, it's a bit very odd from a HR perspective, but it, it's great from a, a, you know, a business or employee perspective because there's always loads of opportunities for employees. And you find employees join us uh, and they may come in as a, a management accountant. And this is a, a live example. Came as a management accountant, moved progress through different roles and then now a port director. So a port director in the ports industry is like a managing director um, operating the PL and um, responsible for people and the operational areas. So you do find in the ports industry, people tend to move across functions quite easily, which is great in terms of career progression. So I'll put in here some examples of roles we do have within Peel Ports. Um, you'll probably find these in your local um, ports industries close to your colleges. Uh, so energy and utilities, um, Peel Ports have a lot of land and therefore we have uh, wind turbines, we, we manage uh, provision of energy to our, um, our businesses that, that sit on our land. So we have an energy and utilities department. And obviously with sustainability and environmental being really high priority for a lot of businesses at the moment, we have our own environmental department who look at what we're doing and making sure we're efficient and meeting our targets that we're setting ourselves. As you'd expect in the ports industry, we've got quite a significant engineering department and engineering obviously is always a challenge in terms of making sure we recruit and then train highly skilled engineers. Uh, part of the UK MPG major, um, Future Skills Project we're working on, on one of the things we are looking at is engineering. So engineering has evolved across the last 5, 10, 20 years. And we do have in the ports industry a lot of automation now, which obviously brings challenges in terms of making sure we, we skill um, and train our engineers to, to be what we need them to be. Uh, traditionally, that our apprentices tend to be engineers and we continue to recruit apprentice engineers. Uh, but we are looking to expand uh, apprentices into many other different departments. So yes, yeah, so engineering is a big department. Obviously, we'll have a lot of service functions within the company. So you'll have the likes of human resources, finance, marketing, IT. Uh, one of the surprising things, again, about working in the ports industry is appreciating the size of the IT departments. Uh, so you obviously have the usual IT department in terms of making sure our computers work and we, we access the internet and all those types of things. Um, but with the automation that we've got, um, the IT department's key to keeping the business operating. Uh, without them, we would really struggle. Uh, with the port industry being very key, um, and you know, if you've ever watched The Wire and all the rest of it, there's a, you know, it's open or more susceptible to crime. So we have a significant cybersecurity department who manage uh, our IT infrastructure and make sure that you know, we're, we're safe. Project management, we always have many different projects. We invest heavily uh, in infrastructure alongside a lot of other, other ports groups out there. So we have quite a significant project management department and they'll manage things like we just had a 300 million pounds investment in Liverpool too with the, the red ship to shore cranes I referred to before. So you obviously need a, a highly qualified project management department to help support with those projects. We have our own police force. So very similar to uh, the police forces you'll know, uh, we have our own police force who, who manage the, the dock estate and make sure uh, we're, we're safe and dealing with things like um, you know, people smuggling, smuggling into the country and uh, dealing with linking with border force, et cetera. Uh, marine department, very key. So we, we employ uh, pilots. So you probably know pilots in terms of airline pilots who fly airplanes. So we have pilots who bring vessels into either the dock system or berth. And it's a highly skilled role. It takes up to seven years to train to be a qualified pilot. Um, obviously, there's benefits that come with that. Uh, but it's a department that we have that is quite unusual to, and it is specific to the ports industry. Property. I mentioned before, we have a lot of land, which therefore has a lot of property on, which therefore has to be managed. So we've got, uh, again, a highly skilled property team from surveyors to property managers, basically. Uh, commercial, obviously we're a growth business. Um, we grow on average 10% a year and we continue to plan to grow by 10% a year. So in relation to that, we need a very strong commercial department to help with our growth plans. Uh, operations, so the bulk of our employees are operational and whether that's terminal managers, business unit managers, port operatives, um, business analysts, resource planners, 
you name it, we've probably got it in our operations departments. And that's the, they're the areas where you find a lot of growth in terms of career progression. You know, someone comes in to support operative and they'll progress through their career path um, up to hopefully port director. Uh, customer services, obviously supplying customers, um, working with um, the hauliers, et cetera, requires customer service departments. Being a port, um, it is a dangerous environment, a lot of plant machinery, heavy containers. So it's really, really important that we protect our employees. Um, safety, like probably a lot of other ports industries, safety is our number one priority. Um, so we have a very significant health and safety department who are highly skilled, require significant training uh, and support the employees and the business. And finally, one of our areas, asset management. So as I mentioned, we've got a lot of plant and machinery and that plant and machinery needs to be managed and making sure it's it's doing what it should be doing from an, uh, you know, is it working point of view? So all the te telemetrics that come with that, you know, are people wearing a seatbelt? How fast are people driving? Are people driving efficiently? All those types of things. So again, a lot of data and um, analytics that go within the asset management department. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a flavor for the different types of roles that we have in the port industry. We require a lot of training that goes into those roles, whether it's people who are recruited with that, that those skills already. Um, a lot of the time we need to train people with those skills because they're very port specific. Uh, so we have you know, significant training that we have to do uh, in any one year. And that's when often we link in with the, the schools, colleges and universities support us with that training, whether it's through apprenticeships or other on the job trainer. We have an apprenticeship strategy that we're working on at the moment. Traditionally, we've tended to recruit the likes of engineers, HR marketing, um, recently IT, but we're currently look, looking at reviewing our overall apprenticeship strategy alongside a graduate um, programme as well. So lots of opportunities. I mentioned before, we obviously, one of our challenges is diversity and how we can increase diversity. So currently working with Hubert College on a, a scholarship programme. Alongside that is looking at, you know, what they perceive as in terms of diversity. Uh, so that, that's one of our challenges I mentioned before. Can you turn the slide, Sarah. Okay, so Freeport, I think Sarah's pretty much covered this, um, but in terms of Peel Ports, so the Freeport doesn't actually impact us directly in terms of we don't need to increase our headcount in the immediate future in relation to free pools, but it does give benefits to the local city region, which we anticipate will then impact on us in due course as, it, as, it, as the city region grows and therefore has a knock-on effect of what needs to be imported and exported into um, the port itself. I need to turn the page, Sarah. And here I've got a video um, that we've done recently regarding our people. These guys and girls just talk about, you know, what they, what they enjoy working at the port, how they've progressed in their careers, and just give you a bit of flavour in the ports industry. Thank you. Working for Peel Ports is fast paced, interesting, and exciting. Challenging and rewarding. Most definitely inspiring. We're one of the largest operators in the UK uh, with ports across Scotland, around the Clyde, mm -hmm. down to Heesham, Manchester Canal, Liverpool being our biggest port, uh, and then down to Portsmouth and Great Yarmouth. And we do have a operation in Dublin as well. So our core values will range from striving for excellence, to personal responsibility, integrity and honesty. But ultimately for me, our, my key core value for the group as a whole is one team who will achieve much more by working together and as a strong team. Peel Ports has helped me to develop and grow in my role by offering me the opportunity to study a, a level 7 HR management degree as a master's. So I was able to do that whilst working full time and continuing in my role of team leader at the time. So I chose Peel Ports as my chosen career, um, basically because Peel Ports are at the forefront of import and export operations. It's a fine mixture of financial, commercial, operational and business aspects. So for me that was a nice combination of keeping things fresh and keeping things different. Ever since I started here at the Gatehouse, basically as a customer service admin, um, all the line managers I've had have always been there to support me. Um, they've helped develop me as well, you know, professional development plans, one-to-ones, all the support I needed was there and the guidance as well for me to take. What I do in summary is that I plan to all vessel movement in and out of all ports owned by Peel. I choose Peel Port because I feel my skills and experience are well suited here and it's a place that I think I could um, 
contribute to the growth of the company as well as um, having to learn more and grow further. We invested heavily in infrastructure across the group, in particular if you think about the £400 million investment in Liverpool too. These could be seen across Liverpool and the world with the eight ship to shore cranes that are widely visible. So it is a really exciting place to work for both our employees and also for the local communities when they see what's being invested. I'm from the local area. Um, Peel Ports is an organisation that's growth potential and there's not many organisations of such size and significance within the local area so growing up it was somewhere that I always thought of the port, I've got family connections to the ports. What inspires me most about working at Pill Ports is probably the impact that it has on the local economy so the volume and diversity of goods that we bring through the ports and I think most recently with the pandemic that um, medical supplies and foodstuffs that still had to come through the port is probably what makes it most inspiring. I think the, one of the main reasons I want to stay at Peel Port is just the camaraderie between the teams. Uh, general Cargo especially, it, it's, it, there's, there's very much like a family vibe. And, uh, I love the people I work with, with everyone that's there, I think. And coming in day to day, I, I just love my job. So, that helps. So the next one is just an interview with Emma. So Emma's in our automation team and just gives a bit of an overview of what her role involves. Automation was just the one that I wanted to go with because it was just the most fun, to be honest. A typical day at Peel. My name's Emma Sanders and I'm an automation technician. I've worked for Peel for about a year and two months. I got into automation because on my apprenticeship we did a variety of things like CNC and uh, PLC programming, robotics, a bit of metrology and automation was just the one that I wanted to go with because it was just the most fun to be honest. A typical day at Peel is basically very different every day. Uh, it can go anywhere from like assisting with breakdowns, doing program changes, uh, investigating root causes or like at the minute we're commissioning the new CRMGs so that's very busy at the minute as you can imagine. Uh, the things I enjoy most about my role is the people that I get to work with. The automation team are very supportive and put a lot of faith in me so that's really nice and I also get to spend a lot of time working with like maintenance and operations and obviously the contractors at the minute. I get to speak to a lot of people and do a lot of different things with a lot of different people, so it's really nice. So the benefits of working for Peel would be um, that there's a lot of like stuff on the horizon, lots of different projects to get involved in, and there's like a lot of opportunities because Peel's quite a big group, so there's a lot of chance to get involved with a lot of different things. To find out more about roles at Peel Ports, please visit the career section of the website. And that was it for my presentation. Hopefully that's give you a bit of a flavour for Peel Ports Group and the port industry and the roles that we have. But yeah, any questions, just please shout out. Has anyone got any questions for Mandy or for Sarah at the moment before we go on to Lorna? I think that's a no, ladies, at the moment. So, uh, Lorna, do you want to pick up and, um, and then we'll have some time at the end for questions as well? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Right, I'm going to go back into my presentation. Here we go. Uh, I think that's the right one. That's where we got to the last time. So, I hope. Um, Sarah and Mandy's presentations have really helped you. I suspect they've blown your mind somewhat. There was a huge amount of information there. And when I looked at Sarah's presentation the first time, the bit that, that jumped out at me was the 36 different government agencies that can intervene with um, cargo, be that human or otherwise, um, coming through a port, which just blew my mind actually. So um, I, hope, I hope you found that useful. So just carrying on. So what, what can Maritime UK and the Careers Programme do to support you in the development of, of your programmes? 
um, and your new pathways. That's what this part of the session is about. I'm going to whiz through it because we're a little bit tight on time. It'll be my fault. I will have talked too much at the beginning. And I've got a video I want to show you anyway. You will get a copy of these slides afterwards. Um, so we have a well stocked and interesting, I would say that, but careers area of the website. Just put Maritime UK careers into Google and you'll find us. So I've got a whole variety of resources on there. And as I said earlier, you are welcome to use any and all of them. Um, so we have information activities. They're longer videos, maybe 20 minutes. Some of them are 40 minutes long. The Exploring Portsmouth International Port that I talked to you about is there and you've obviously got a hyperlink to it that you can watch after this session. But that would be a really good thing to be sharing with prospective students or even at this stage with other staff members from your colleges so they can also understand it. It was put together to um, appeal to 14 to 18, 19 year olds, probably. Um, but I learn a lot from from watching it. We've created a bank of virtual tours, which include ports and some vessels. Um, most of the videos are two or three minutes long. Um, we've used them on social media. I have to say that, that the young people have really engaged with these. We only created these virtual tours in March for National Careers Week. And the last time I checked the stats on YouTube, I think it's about 13 videos. They've been watched 8,000 times. So these are proving to be popular. And I think what's happening is people are watching one, then they're watching the next one and watching the next one. There's a super one that takes you around the inside of one of the Royal Navy's ice patrol ships that, that um, works in the Antarctic. But there's also um, short videos explaining um, the work of, of ports and marine services and so on and so forth. And there's a terrific, proper, interactive virtual tour of DP World, which uh, it's one of the, it's a bit like Google Maps. You know, you click on one building, you can go inside that building and have a look at it. Um, we, as a programme, have a bank of maritime industry ambassadors. The, the last time I checked, we were up to 121 uh, maritime professionals who will give up their time to support school and college career work. Now that's done through the Inspiring the Future platform, which is a charity. Um, if you haven't already registered uh, to be part of that, I, I can only recommend it. It doesn't cost you anything. There's over a thousand schools and colleges in the UK that are already registered. What you do is you go on, you create an event and then you request industry ambassadors to support it. And it's not just maritime ambassadors. That's why, that's why I'm selling it so much. So I've I was just looking at an email that comes through about requests to support some mock interviews. And what I've said to that particular school on the Isle of Wight, go and get registered on Inspire in the Future because they'll take the pain out of that sort of um, organisation of careers activity. But our industry ambassadors will come and do assembly light -like talks for you. There'll be guest speakers. They'll come and do mock interviews. They'll support careers fairs, but they will also support project work, classroom work, etc. Um, you, your careers leader or your careers advisor, your head of careers could join our careers professionals network. We've got about 400 careers professionals are part of that network now. They get a newsletter from me approximately once every couple of months. I'm not very good at doing that sort of thing, but I, I do communicate with them. We invite them to CPD sessions where we look at particular industries within the sector in more in more detail. So next week, for example, on Wednesday, we're running an hour long um, uh, Teams meeting, but looking at design based careers in maritime. And I've got a um, an architect coming to talk about port infrastructure. I've got a, uh, a naval architect coming to talk about boat building design and, and development. And then we've got a lady who runs an organisation called Helm Innovation who makes stuff for the maritime sector. And they won prizes recently for a, um, a ladder design where you can move at sea where you can transfer from one vessel to another. But it's got a much higher safety um, uh, rating, if you like, and she won awards for that. So, so if you've got young people that are interested in in design based careers and, and they're not even thinking about the maritime sector, maybe art and design students, they might find that useful. Um, we we you can share all the links to the website. You we've recently been creating a number of short 
um, videos where we meet maritime people. Again, it was it was activity that was started for um, Apprenticeship Week and then National Careers Week. Um, five questions in five minutes, people talking about their job, how they got to it, what their pathway was, what their career highlight has been, what they wish they knew when they were 16, if they were giving themselves some advice. And you will find some ports people in amongst that um, resource. There's a tw between 25 and 30, I can't remember exactly how many of those interviews we've got, but I'm canvassing to the sector to bring more people um, through onto that resource. Because again, it's something that's going down really well with young people and um, people sort of researching the, the sector. Um, so we've got our ambassadors network, we've got our careers professionals network, take a tour around the website and have a look at the resources that are there. If there's something missing that you really need, I just need you to tell me. If you say, right, we're looking at our programme and actually what we could really do with is X, put it to me and I'll see if I can create that for you and help you with it. The other thing I would want to say is that a commitment that we have made to the Careers Colleges Trust is that we'll support you all with the work that you're going to be doing with your feeder secondary schools. So obviously there's going to be some sort of um, uh, logistics careers kind of engagement work that you're going to be doing through schools liaison in order that the young people when they're applying have got an idea that this course is coming. Now if I can help you with that work I would be absolutely delighted to do so and in fact if you wanted to arrange one of these meetings with your careers leaders or, or careers advisors from all your feeder secondary schools and you wanted me to support that to help them understand better what's going on absolutely delighted to do that for you it's not a problem i also was speaking with southampton university this morning that um includes what was the warsash marine um uh, academy formerly but they've got the most fantastic suite of simulators for um for careers at sea they would be delighted to work with any or all of you in helping you share news about where maritime qualifications can go to if you wanted to go on to university and if anyone wanted to take groups of students down to um, Southampton you'd be welcome with open arms obviously once we can do that sort of thing again so we're, we're in this for the long haul we're here to help you develop the marketing the prospectus the information and guidance around your program to make sure that when we get to September 23 23 is that right 22 September 22 that you've got full courses and whatever I can do to help happy to do that and that's my email address for those of you that that don't have it already and then if if you'll um I th well I think perhaps Rachel we haven't had many questions from the floor I don't know whether it's better to run a video or to see if we've got questions coming through people can watch a video in their own time can't they if, if there's questions that anyone wants to ask if not, I'll run the video anyway, but really, it's over to you. Shall we see if we've got any pressing questions? I, I know a couple of people have had to leave. Has anyone got any questions for Lorna, Sarah or Mandy or myself at this point? Uh, if not, we'll, we'll finish and close with um, the video and then people can leave, uh, you know, as and when you need to at, at half past three. I don't see any questions. So before uh, Lorna play, plays the, the final video, um, I just want to say a, a huge thank you to uh, Sarah and Amanda and to Lorna for their input today. Um, we, you know, we, we can't do it out. We, we can't do this without the collaboration of others. Um, and, you know, I think um, it, it, it's really interesting to see all of those different diverse careers in the sector and so we need to make sure we're filling those with our young people we will make sure that the the slides and as i said we've got two two presentations practically identical so we'll work out which is the better of the two and send those out to you so lorna do you want to press play on the video and then um will people can just sort of leave as 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 they choose to sure it's a great video it's a great video, yeah. I would say that. Though. My career in Maritime's changed my life because it's allowed me to see things that people don't see every day. It's allowed me to meet good people and expand my knowledge and my experience. 
Don't be put off by what you think a stereotypical career in maritime might look like. There's lots you can get involved in um, and it's a really exciting industry to be in. My name's Jay Crichton, I'm 27 years old. I'm an electrical engineer at the Peel Ports Group in Liverpool. When I was in school, I never knew what I wanted to be when I was older. My dad technologies teacher, Jessa, doing engineering. Peel Ports have supported my career development by allowing me to do on-the-job training and on-the-job learning by going back to college one day a week to do further education. Well, Jay come to us, she had some previous experience, but she's done really well to pick up on our own bespoke technology, if you like, fitted in really well. We've had quite a lot of apprentices and trainees that have won awards. They get all the support from the business that we can give them. I'm a prime example myself. I was part of the, the development scheme going back to the late 80s with the apprenticeship with the old Maisie Docks and Harbour Company. I've obviously progressed up, to, up the, the chain. I'm now a manager, been a manager now for nearly 20 years on this site. My name is Olivia Baden and I am an associate solicitor in the commercial team at Bradness. Liv has been um, an excellent training, absolutely fabulous. She's working her way through the career ranks very quickly, which is a clear sign of a lawyer performing. Before joining Bradness, I hadn't done any sort of maritime related work and then having the opportunity to, um, to do a secondment at Peel Ports has really made me realise how much of an interesting industry this is. There are so many entry points and ways into the maritime industry within the Liverpool city region. From apprenticeships at businesses like Camel Airs or Peel Ports, in the traditional roles that you might think of when you talk about maritime, to roles that are office-based, working for shipping lines as customs clerks or administrators. We are seeing huge changes within the maritime industry that are bringing about a green revolution, but also a shift towards technology. So there are great opportunities for young people to be part of that and to drive the agenda forward. Great, thanks Lorna. Um, well, if there's no further questions, um, I hope for, for those of you from our college network, you've, you've really enjoyed the presentations and certainly some of the comments that have come up in the chat box um, have been really positive. Um, so, you, you know, thank you very much for attending. Um, please share, share the message, share the word, word, the word, and, you know, when we send these out, share it, you know, I, I can appreciate, it's been a tough year for FE this year with, with dealing with the pandemic. So um, when your college, when your staff come back um, in the new academic year, you know, we really want to be making sure that um, careers in, in logistics are promoted. Lorna's got some fantastic expertise there. And, and as, as Lorna said, please ask, ask the question, and if there is something that you haven't got that you would need, you know, through all of our stakeholder networking, you know, we will be able to source, I'm sure, um, I'm sure source it for you. So thank you very much. Helen, we can see you typing away. You're on mute. Yeah, sorry. It probably would have been easier just to say it anyway. But yeah, I mean, it just to say, really, really interesting. This is a whole new sector for me. Semi familiar with road and obviously very familiar with aviation, but not at all in ports. Um, so from my perspective, um, you know, I obviously need to have a look at, you know, what's happening at Bristol. Again, you know, I've had no contact at all with the Port of Bristol just to see exactly what their needs are and, you know, and, and what careers they have available there so that um, I can obviously take what I've learned today and, and try and apply it, 
to you know a possible partnership with them in the future so yeah okay. so thank you very much everybody no thanks helen thanks ever so much have a good have a good break in the summer yes we'll do yes see you back see you back at the end of august absolutely see you soon all right thank you bye. rachel bye 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 bye, bye. bye. bye.